Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call this meeting to order. We'll start this meeting with our traditional land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and uh, traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth, our relations. May we honor those teachings. And I'd ask for 30 seconds of silent reflection. Thank you. If you'd uh, join me in the singing of our national anthem, please stand. Council for the City of Peterborough recognizes the principles contained in our Constitution and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mr. Clerk, is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest? Mr. Chair, I see none at this time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask for a mover to receive these presentations tonight. Councillor Duguay, Councillor Vasiliadis. We'll go to a vote. Thank you very much. So the reports we'll be receiving tonight are part of our budgeting process, which will take place over this week and next week. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming out tonight because, and hopefully, hopefully we'll all walk away with a better understanding. Um, so I'd like to call our first presenter, if I may, uh, uh, Ms. Tuffin. And if I can ask you to state your name and your address and uh, who your favorite counselor is, please. Oh, I have to pick one? This is a lot of stress, Dave. Choose wisely. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to answer some of those questions. <laughs> so my name is Lois Tuffin. I am the founder slash instigator of Volunteer Peterborough. I live in Autonomy Township nearby here. Thank Can you get you, actual Lord. address? You have, no, that's fine. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. So I'm really grateful to have the time to speak with you this evening, talk about a very exciting project that kind of rose out of City Hall but has taken on new life. 
So I'm going to start with some bad news. So over the last three years, those dark three years, more than half of uh, Ontario's agencies and nonprofits lost a drastic number of volunteers. And since things have kind of started to return to normal, about 40% of them are still having problems getting people to come back. That reflects the reality in Peterborough as well. So meanwhile, while these people really need volunteers, a lot of people have moved to new communities or they're young people that haven't found their niche yet, they've recently retired and they're looking for a way to get involved. So until recently, the greatest initial barrier to connecting these dots was a lack of a central place to discover organizations that match those interests. Well, I'm gonna tell you how we're starting to bridge that gap. So earlier this year, Age Friendly Peterborough had a small volunteer task force and had budgeted $5,000 to develop a website to, to list these local volunteer roles. Now, when we were formed, we started talking with them and Age Friendly Peterborough joined our steering committee and has contributed that $5,000 towards the development of the Volunteer Peterborough website. If you haven't seen it, go play. It's got some really cool stuff in there. I know in your copious spare time, guys. Uh, so since then, we have created this robust hyperlocal solution with those funds. Plus, we've got funding from additional community partners. And that site does more than list places to volunteer. We've actually built it like a dating app. So it aligns people more quickly with the tasks they want and the causes that really that fit their interests. We've also secured more than $50,000 worth of advertising when we launched in July. Thank, uh, it cost us not that much at all, thanks to the generosity and belief in our cause by our media partners. At this point, we have more than 400 people signed up looking for something to do, and uh, they've identified what they're interested in and when they are available. We also have 90 organizations that have registered and started posting jobs, and that number grows every week. We're just getting started, and that's our power, is drawing on all these people in the community who really feel the need for this this uh, or, or information. We have dozens of leadership volunteers working on our cause. And just last month, our first part-time employee started. She's a program manager working on a four-month contract thanks to a grant from Telecare Peterborough. So this person is supervised by the Chamber of Commerce. Meanwhile, we have benefited from a coalition that draws expertise and funding from the Community Foundation, the New Canadian Centre, Trent University's Career Space, Crestwood Secondary School, and various sponsors. Therefore, that small investment from Age Family Peterborough has paid off with an impressive multiplier effect. And now we're up and running. We need to keep up that momentum. You knew this was coming. So we're in the midst of showing organizations how to use the site and prove its value to them because later this year, we're going to uh, implement a membership-based model to provide base funding so we can keep going and doing the important work that we do. But until we get those funds, we need a boost from you. The County of Peterborough has already added $5,000 for us in its draft 2024 budget, and today we're asking you to do the same. This small investment will help us cover just the website hosting fees and host a volunteer fair to do more of those matches. And this event will, will put more people in with the agencies. So it's really going to enrich their lives. In return, we all get an innovative, low-cost, high ROI solution to a really pressing problem. So going forward, we're going to keep researching the best practices and tools that we need to, for volunteer coordination and recruitment. We're gonna promote diverse volunteers and their experiences. We're gonna have celebrations. And we're going to recruit, continue to recruit people for an emergency volunteer registry. Those are the people you guys can call on next time a derecho blows through town or there's a flood or whatever. You can turn to us and we can get people. One minute remaining, thank you. Oh, hon, I'm, I'm on schedule, we're good. Uh, we can also coordinate a database of large volunteers next time we host something like the Canada Senior Games or the Canadian uh, Disc Golf Championships that are coming here. So we have this, this database that has all these people that have identified what their skills are, what they wanna do. So additionally, we strengthen small charities who don't have that in-house expertise such as um, to do this type of work. And we are also working on leadership training to develop boards of directors and maybe some future counselors, you just never know. So every person that signs on with us becomes part of the fabric of a more tight-knit community. And after the COVID years, that's exactly what we need. Our work supports your libraries, art galleries, shelters, and, and more. How many volunteers does the city use in, a, in an average week? Just think about it. So everyone has time to give, even if they don't have money, and we just make it easier for them to do so. 
So by supporting our work with us, $5,000, you get an amplified effect. So please help us empower the people of Peterborough to fill in the cracks to create a stronger city. Lois, thank you very much. And had you answered the question properly, you would have had unlimited time earlier, but good to know. We may have some are. questions for you here, yeah, your worship. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Lois and you and I had a meeting on this. And, we did. And as we were chatting that day, I see you were having a, a conversation with our new government relations person, uh, Sarah. I Dugo am. Barron, I'm a big and fan of Sarah. Commissioner of Finance is uh, Mr. Friedman. As we uh, develop and put together Service Peterborough, which we're doing yes. right now, yes, uh, I would think it might be an opportunity to integrate Volunteer Peterborough into that broader platform of Service Peterborough. It's true. Uh, we we talked really about that training. And I would suspect if we did that, that'd be worth a lot more than $5,000 that you're looking for this evening. But we'll leave that for a conversation for another day. Yes, and to your point, um, we, we've, I've spoken with Mr. Friedman about um, having the, those frontline workers understand how the database works so that they can, they can walk people through it. And everybody's an ambassador for us. Yes, any, anyone else? Any other questions? Thank you very much, Lois. Thank you. I'd like to call Mr. Doherty up from Showplace, please. You know the drill. You don't get unlimited time, by the way, Ken. But I know your Mr. Name Chairman. And, name and address, please. My name is Ken Doherty. I'm the chair of the board for Showplace Peterborough. And uh, I live at 15 Ann Street here in Peterborough. First of all, I would like to thank all of council for your ongoing support through the service grant program. I especially appreciate having Councillor LaChica on our board as a, as a member on behalf of Council that uh, pays dividends for us in terms of information sharing. I'd also like to introduce Scott Lale, our new Executive Director. Scott just joined us on October 23rd. And also in terms of uh, recognition, I would point out that I believe a letter is being circulated on behalf of all of the service grant recipient organizations and show place as a co-signatory of that uh, letter. And I believe you'll be receiving a copy of it. The timing of the proposed reductions to service grants is unfortunate. Show place has just recovered from a deficit and especially from COVID-19. And, but as you'll see, we're poised to move forward. Let me tell you where we've come from, where we're going, and especially why the service grant is so important to show place to our peers in the rest of the room and to the city. When the federal government announced its first joint infrastructure program in 1994, the city agreed to include show place as a city project provided Showplace fundraised the city $640,000 to access matching federal and provincial funding. Showplace raised 1.2 million from the community. The city added an extra 40,000 of capital funding and an interest-free loan of 300,000, all towards the $3.2 million project that would become Showplace. Showplace was and remains one of the few not-for-profit registered charity performance venues in the province that is not owned and operated by a municipality. In 1995, the city designated Showplace as a municipal capital facility, and I'll speak more to that later. By, 2020, uh, by, by 2001, however, Showplace was already facing an operational deficit and, uh, and uh, operational challenges. The board approached the city for funding, some of you at least one will remember that, um, and secured an annual operating grant, which was the forerunner of the service grant program. Subsequently, there have been periodic bump ups in funding, inflationary increases, and capital contributions from the city to Showplace. Showplace last made a presentation to council, I believe in 2017, again in response to a significant deficit. Again, the city stepped up and provided an extra $30,000 in operating funding support and $150,000 in capital support. This boost helped show place board and staff turn things around. J 
During the COVID hiatus, our Act 2 fundraising committee raised significant capital dollars from the community and again used the money from the city to leverage federal and provincial grants for capital projects. This allowed us to replace all this, the original secondhand theater seating, refresh the theater walls and floor, replace the HVAC systems, replace our, our marquee sign, upgrade our cabling connectivity throughout the building, and completely renovate our foyer. Showplace recently received comp a comprehensive needs assessment of all of our building components for future planning. And we're also midway through a strategic planning process. Unfortunately, we've also learned that our roof needs to be replaced. So we are ex anticipating some expense. A couple words about our service grants and why they're so important. The service grant programs exist to provide support to organizations that provide a service that the city would otherwise be expected to provide. Many of the service grant recipients operate recreation and cultural facilities, many of which have been officially recognized by the city as municipal capital facilities under the Municipal Act. This means that they don't pay municipal taxes or education taxes, and typically there's an agreement with the city that has reversionary rights that the city would assume ownership if the facility or of the or facility if the organization failed. In terms of Showplace, the annual service grant is critical to our operations. It helps us provide 150 event days per year to over 35,000 residents and visitors. It makes up 15% of our operating budget. It helps us support other community users. It's our only external funding on the operating side. And most importantly, it's a tangible indicator of our contract with the city. We hope that you will entertain retaining the current level of funding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, Council, any questions for Mr. Doherty? Good to see you back. Thank Take you. care. Next, I would like to call uh, Andy Craig from New Canadian Centre, please. Mr. Craig, if you could state your name, which we have a good idea of what it is already, but uh, your address and uh, you have five minutes. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andy Craig. I live at 588 Harvey Street in Peterborough, not just down the street. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you about the city's 2024 budget. As mentioned, my name is Andy Craig and I am the executive director of the New Canadian Centre of Peterborough. At NCC, we provide a range of programs and services to people who are new to Canada and to the broader community. This year, we expect to serve almost 1,500 unique clients from nearly 100 different countries. Through our refugee resettlement program over the past several years, we have supported hundreds of individuals and families fleeing violence and persecution from around the world, finding safe harbor and a fresh start here in Peterborough. We are at the point now that almost 100% of population growth in Canada comes from immigration. Millions of baby boomers are set to retire over the coming five to 10 years. And I'm sure you're aware that Peterborough is an older community with an average age well above the national average. The average age of recent immigrants is substantially below the national average. Increasing diversity is a reality in Canada. Almost one in four people in Canada were born in another country. And more than 80% of new immigrants now come from countries outside of Western Europe. Why am I telling you all of this? The work we do at the New Canadian Centre and with the support of the city is about community building. It is about economic development. It is about ensuring a vibrant and inclusive community. Multiculturalism is a great ideal to celebrate. It takes work to make it positive. Diversity is clearly a fact in Canada and increasingly in Peterborough. Inclusion and belonging take work though and NCC is doing that work. We deliver a lot of community programming, sharing stories of diversity to foster inclusion. Our Living Library program has facilitated newcomers to share their stories with hundreds of people locally, from church groups to school groups. Our Newcomer Leadership Group and NCC Young Leaders help bring diverse voices to local boards and committees. We even published a children's book that has been read to hundreds of local school children. We have more than 250 active volunteers, many of whom are newcomers themselves giving back. Our volunteer teams support families with basic needs like navigating grocery shopping in a new country, buying a used car, 
uh, introducing kids to tobogganing for the first time than more than anything else, making their first local friends. We help people find their feet, discover community, and get to the point where they are making a positive contribution to our community economically, socially, and culturally, really, that they're thriving. This is what the city is contributing to with the service grant. The service grant is by no means the only support that the city provides, but it is an important one. The city is an active partner with the Peterborough Immigration Partnership, which NCC leads. Our staff collaborate regularly with city social service staff at the library, with the art gallery and the museum. We manage the Welcome Peterborough website portal on behalf of the city. The recent welcoming week activities in September was just one of many events that we've collaborated on with the city. The city is committing to important projects in your 2024 budget and you need to find new revenue and reduce existing expenses. Believe me, as a manager of a nonprofit, I appreciate that challenge. I used to sit on the city's community grants committee and I remember city staff, including Ken, who you've heard from already, stole my thunder on this, describing the city service grant program as being for organizations delivering programs and services that the city wanted to ensure would continue to exist that what we do as service grant recipients is of such value that if it stopped, it would cause a challenge or even a crisis and the city might even have to step in and figure out how to deliver that service, that these organizations are integral to the fabric of our community. I don't envy the task that you have in front of you in crafting next year's budget, but I urge you to look elsewhere for the cost savings you need to find to fund planned expenditures. I look forward to continuing together, the new Canadian Centre, the city and all service grant recipients in a spirit of close collaboration and appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, very much. And I didn't even give you the one minute warning. So it was right on. <laughs> Any questions from Council? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Leslie Manaw of Art Space, please. If we could get your name, address. Please. Sure. So it's Leslie Mena, and I live at 527 Park Hill Road West. Thank you very much. You have five minutes. Thank you. So hello, everyone. My name is Leslie Mena, and I'm the Artistic Director at ArtSpace, Peterborough's Artist-Run Centre. ArtSpace is in receipt of the annual service grant for which, to our distress, the city has proposed a 5% decrease in 2024. This is an alarming shift from previous year's proposed annual 1.5 increases. And though this, although the savings to the city is negligible as a result of this cut, what it represents to service grant recipients like us is that our ability to deliver reliable quality programming is destabilized. The stability of the city's support is key to our ability to leverage this funding for grants at other levels. And so this decision puts those opportunities at risk. Also, as luck would have it, 2024 marks ArtSpace's 50th anniversary. Throughout those, these 50 years, ArtSpace has stu been stewarded by innumerable artists and arts administrators to create paid exhibition and professional development opportunities for fellow artists regionally and at large. It has fostered long-standing relationships within the business community, decades-long ties to Trent University, and a reputation for which we are so very proud within the arts and cultural sectors across Ontario, the country and beyond. And we continually attract volunteers from high school students to university and college interns and co-op students to university profs, business leaders and fellow artists to serve on our board for 50 years and counting. ArtSpace has been a think tank and a make tank for critical thinkers, change makers, and community builders. Today, in addition to presenting seasonal exhibitions, programming, we operate a maker space and a myriad of public engagement and professional development opportunities. We offer monthly workshops in life drawing, printmaking, and working with text, and other ancillary programming as it relates to the material on exhibition and the tools in our maker space. And in our continued recovery from pandemic circumstances, which were dramatic, we are functioning in new ways to address need in our community. For one, we operate a series of arts-based drop-in workshops in partnership with One City. 
catered to Peterborough community members surviving crisis circumstances. And for another example, we are continually working to bolster the skills and problem solving competencies of our staff and volunteers with professional development training focused on nonviolent communication and diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. The work we do is so meaningful, so relevant, and so essential. There is a broad agreement within the business community that a thriving art scene is key to attracting and retaling, retaining talent uh, outside of the arts community, and that the arts play a substantial role in downtown economic revitalization work. At this moment, and this no moment is certainly no exception, did you know, according to the Ontario Arts Council, 65% of Ont Ontario business leaders say that a thriving arts and culture scene is something that would make it easier to attract top talent in their community. 79% of Ontarians believe that the government should spend public dollars to support the arts. 80% of Ontarians agree that an active local art scene helps communities attract business. 90% of, of Ontarians agree that arts experiences help bring people from diverse backgrounds together as a community. Leslie, one minute. Sure. Thank you. And 93% of Ontarians believe that arts activities help to enrich the quality of our lives. As a charitable nonprofit organization in a city of our scale, and proximity to larger urban centers, I am compelled to remind folks what a vital treasure we have in art space and what a unique characteristic it is for Peterborough to be the home turf of an artist run center. I assure you that even a small reduction in art spaces funding has a substantial impact on us. I sincerely hope you will reconsider this proposed cut on behalf of art space and its vast community. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard this evening. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Thank you, Leslie. Nicola Koyanagi, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Probably the shortest presentation this evening. Okay, why don't we go to Tegan Moss from Peterborough Green Up, please. Tegan, if you could state your name, address, and yeah, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Tegan Moss and I live at 530 Sherbrooke. I'm here tonight, as you all know, to speak to the City Service Grant Program. And in reflecting on the budget, I'm struck by the weight of the decisions before all of you. So I'd like to personally thank each of you for the efforts that you've taken to understand the budget before you and to reflect on the impacts that we'll have on our community now and in the future. So, th so thank you. Uh, and in thinking about that, when I look at the list of service grant recipients, I'm struck by the collective impact of the organizations that it funds. The social fabric that I know makes Peterborough a wonderful place to live, work, and play is one that includes the arts, community supports, and environmental organizations like my own. Reflecting on this list makes me incredibly grateful for the service grant program, for the fact that it exists at all, and I would like to thank staff and council for the ongoing investment that this program has made in our community. It's, it's working. Uh, and as you all are aware, I work for Peterborough Green Up and we're one of 22 service grant organizations. Uh, we're one of the many organizations uh, facing a 3.5% funding reduction in the 2024 portion of the proposed budget. Now, GreenUp was established in 1992, and it's now known as a regional leader for sustainability, community engagement, and really not surprisingly, all things green. It's right in the name. And for 20 years, the service grant program or versions of this program have been a model that has been a part of how we operate. 
the stable source of operating funding has allowed GreenUp to efficiently and effectively advance community programming that responds to current environmental issues that our community is facing. Funding provided by the service grant has allowed us to become an award-winning leader in sustainability. And the long-term commitment that the city has made has been a major contributor to that success. Our team is currently 18 staff and we work on a wide variety of program areas. We work on greenhouse gas emissions reductions, waste reduction, active transportation, water conservation, nature education, and green infrastructure implementation. And we're very fortunate to work with the city as a partner on many of these service areas. And in several of them, such as Shifting Gears and in the Rain Garden Subsidy Program, we provide contracted services that have specific deliverables for the city of Peterborough. The service grant, however, contributes to our operation in a way that's truly unique. Unlike the vast majority of funding opportunities available to not-for-profits, the service grant can be allocated to support administrative costs and it can be allocated to ensure that priority programming can be delivered even in the absence of other funding. So when we see a need to continue offering a program or service, we have the flexibility within our team to make that decision internally. In 2022, GreenUp Green Service Grant was around $200,000. That made up about 17% of our operating budget. And we were successful in leveraging that money to secure an additional $650,000 in grants and donations. That's you know, not including contracts and fee-for-service programs that were additionally delivered beyond that. Uh, so your investment in our organization resulted in a fourfold ability to uh, advance sustainability across the city of Peterborough. Some examples of work that GreenUp is able to deliver of, as a result of the service grant uh, include the operation of Ecology Park, a five acre urban park that is known to be a gem for uh, diverse native species, including plants and trees that you might not find anywhere else in the city. Uh, and it's uh, an area where we're able to invite thousands of children each year to participate in environmental education. Ecology Park alone typically uh, utilizes around 30% of the service grant that's allocated to, to Peterborough Greenup. Other examples of, of programs that we're able to deliver include the Store and Resource Center. The Store and Resource Center is open six days a week for people to come and to ask questions about programs and services that allow them to live in a way that's more environmental. One of the things that that could include is the purchase of blue boxes, or more recently, to ask questions about waste management in the city of Peterborough. One more minute. Uh, you might be, uh, you know, interested to speak to Dave to learn about how uh, impactful that's been for residents. We also use the service grant um, to, to provide uh, capacity for the development of programs like our home energy department, which will be instrumental in the delivery of the home energy efficiency program that the city of Peterborough will be launching later this year. The service grant has allowed us to invest in equipment, training, and the organizational structure that will support the successful delivery of the home energy efficiency program. So these types of programs are what GreenUp is able to accomplish as a result of your ongoing investment. And I must ask that council please consider reinstating the 1.5% planned increase to service grant funding. The good work that GreenUp does for and with the city is made possible through this sustained investment. And I look forward to continue to work alongside staff and council to ensure that we're successful now and in the future. Thank you, Tegan, very much. Any questions of council? Seeing none, thank you. Before we go on to the next speaker, um, I, I'll just say that uh, Ms. Koyanagi had left us a note saying that she couldn't attend until after eight o'clock and she wanted to speak to the police budget. Since we won't be here at eight o'clock, I would ask her if she could to email us her comments at City Hall, please. Um, Rob Hillman, please. Mr. Hellman, your name, address, and five minutes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. My name is Rob Hellman, and I live at 500 Murray Street. So as, as other speakers tonight have mentioned, I would like to begin, of course, by recognizing the incredible work, the incredibly difficult work that it is to produce a budget on the size of the city of Peterborough's. 
we all know that the tax increase that we is on the table before us is higher than anybody might want to see. But it's, it does not seem to me that it is a, a wasteful or uh, inefficient budget. Um, with that in mind, I'm here above all else to beseech you as you're considering any changes you might to make to the draft before you uh, to exercise a great deal of prudence and careful deliberation. Um, I know that there is going to be great pressure to find places to save money. Um, and with the, the budget we have before us, anywhere it seems could be would be an incredibly difficult choice that requires great deliberation. Uh, municipal budgets seem to be exceptionally difficult because of the source of revenue that's available to us. I was actually really interested, um, Peterborough Currents and Arthur Newspaper released yesterday a podcast on the budget where they interviewed uh, Harry Kitchen, Professor Emeritus of Economics at Trent University, which made me think back to some years ago when I had the privilege of taking some classes with him. And, and one thing that he mentioned is that property taxes are not necessarily a fair tax or an efficient tax. Unlike other sources of taxation, property taxation has no connection with the taxpayer's ability to pay. So an idea that's been floated in recent years, and I think it would be worthwhile for Peterborough to consider making this ask is for perhaps a direct allocation of higher level government's taxes, such as the HST, to be allocated to municipal budgets. I believe that Olivia Chow is currently trying to negotiate that on behalf of the city of Toronto. And I think by analogy, really every municipality in the country could be looking for something like that. We also have the challenge of um, property assessments. If you look at the, you know, we look at $260,000 of assessed value. If you look at real estate prices in Peterborough, that is a farcical number. I don't think anybody can deny it. If we were to wave a magic wand and have property values, properties be assessed at their actual market values, the exact same budget could be billed as a 40% decrease in taxation. And of course, we live in a continued high inflation environment. We managed to dodge that in the budget, thanks to the great work of this council in the previous and the past couple of years, but it seems like it's catching up with us. But like I say, this isn't a wasteful budget that we have before us. If you look, this is best exemplified if you look at the possible service cuts that are identified in, in the draft budget. If you go through all of them, if we were to implement every single one of those cuts, we would not reach the target the guideline that was set by this council back in the summer. At, at the, the, the hurt of that cost would be would nowhere near be worth the savings. The best example of the single largest item there is the downtown street repairs. That is $2.3 million. That's a big amount. It would get the property tax increase down by more than a percent at the low, low cost of having downtown streets, quote, fall into an unmanageable state of disrepair. If we look at the increase in the levy requirement, there's three main areas that make up about three quarters of the tax increase before us. The first is personnel and compensation. The second is the capital levy. And the third is the police budget. The first in personnel, it seems like, and I know some of our unions might not agree, we're getting an excellent deal with on. The living wage in Peterborough increased in the last year by 8%. So having personnel costs be expected to increase by 4.2% in the next year is an excellent bargain. With respect to the capital levy, we already know the amount on the table is insufficient. There's $11.9 million called out in the budget as funding that is needed, but not included in the budget in the next year. So that 1% can't seem to come down. And the third, of course, is the police budget. This is the... the single largest increase uh, line item in the budget, and one that I know is, is contentious through its size. Um, I personally question the value that we would receive from that, but I also recognize that there's only limited power to control police budgets, and of course, the Ontario Civilian Police Commission has the final say, and when, when the police and the and municipalities go head-to-head -head at the OPC, OCPC, municipalities seldom seem to win. Robert, one minute. Great, thank you. Um, so just in conclusion, to wrap up, you know, we face a number of challenges in, in Peterborough and in the world that can only be addressed with the assistance or the involvement of the public sector, including the municipal sector. The housing crisis, the addiction crisis, the climate crisis, um, you know, issues with, with employment and economic development. These aren't challenges that Peterborough as a municipality can meet on its own. But unfortunately, higher levels of government are all too often absent 
And that absence only increases the importance of the investments that are proposed in this budget. I would love to speak at length about uh, particular items in the, in, the, uh, in the budget, but I think I have about 20 seconds left. So I will just say that in the budget, what you are doing is articulating a vision with dollars for what you want our community and its values to be in the coming year. So please make that choice with great care and great caution. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Any questions from council? Seeing none, have a nice Thank evening. Thank you. Uh, Sue Ditta, please, Electric City Culture Council. Sue, nice to see you again. Um, your Thank name, you. address, and uh, my, away you go. My name is Sue Ditta. I live at 591 Gilmore Street. And I'm the executive director of the Electric City Culture Council. Um, I want to thank you all very much for letting me speak to you tonight. Um, I want to talk tonight about community well-being. And Natalie's tried to help me with the community well-being slide up there. And Leslie Minaw uh, covered some of the ground of the Ontario Arts Council's most recent research on how the arts contribute to community well-being. This is the concept that's at the heart of Peterborough's new strategic plan, something that anchors all of our policies and every department in the city. It's driving or should be driving our collective financial investments in the very difficult 2024 budget. It means we're talking about a robust economy, mental and physically healthy citizens, a protected environment, and rich community identity and cohesiveness. It's all about a forward-looking contemporary community that thrives in creativity and a modern economy. As you can see from the results of the NANO survey, which I think you all have a paper copy of, um, this was uh, most Ontarians think investing in the arts is critical to achieving these community well-being goals and objectives. The city of Peterborough has known this for a long time and has made tremendous investments um, in the arts over the years, and we want to thank you for that. They've made a huge difference to the quality of our lives here. And the same can be said of the investments in the many community service organizations that enrich our municipality. It's a very big bang for the buck, and your support has encouraged partnerships and collaborations that stretch those dollars further and further. When you read, read the headlines these days, it's hard to see a path to community well-being. Everything seems pretty dim and pretty dark, but EC3 can see it. We see it every day with the arts organizations and the artists that we work with. We hear it in the voices of the children in Anna Edith's youth chorus, in the swell of the horns, the woodwinds, and the strings of the Peterborough Symphony Orchestra, alongside the powerful voice of Indigenous Poet Laureate Sarah Lewis when they perform at Showplace on the attentive faces of the crowds at the Market Hall during the Reframe Film Festival in a bitter January weekend. We see it in John Maris's hands when he teaches ceramics to the teenagers taking refuge at the Yes Shelter. We see it in the joy, the utter joy of the COVID era crowds gathered along the river to see public energy's dancers float on the water. In the faces of the senior citizens laughing hysterically at the Veranda Society, um, on the lawn at Trail College during Arts Week. Whole families promenading with Jennifer Elchuk's giant insects through Ecology Park with the Greenup folks. The Bollywood dancers who we connected with, sorry, I think they are coming down with COVID. Just having short, some shortness of breath here. Would you like some water, Sue? I'd love some water, okay. thank you. Um, no, I'm okay, I'm thanks. Thanks, gee, willikers. Um, the Bollywood dancers at Peterborough Square, and we were able to connect with those folks through the new Canadian Center. In artist Julia Nguyen's uh, residency, Signaling Spring, Vietnamese Canadian style at Art Space. And we hear it, we feel it, we see it. It illuminates that pathway to community well-being. We see it in Kate's story, thank you, Sarah McNeely, 
and John Hederick's passionate plays about family history and survival at the Theatre on King. We get inspiration from Elizabeth Jenkins' powerful poems about race, pain, and the strength and courage to survive. And we are exhilarated and can almost feel the ice flying off John Kleinman Hague's paintings of hockey players. We see that as a pathway to community well-being. We appreciate so much the investments that have been made in the organizations and the individuals who make all of those things possible. And we want to get you to join the 100 voices of the Peterborough Singers to stay the course. Don't cut the arts. Please don't cut the community groups or the community grants. Provide the small increases that are needed to keep the lights on in these dark times. Let's make things better and move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Take a moment, have some water. Any questions from council? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Tricia Clarkson, who will be joining us remotely. Uh, Natalie will set that up for us. Hello. Yes. Ms. Clarkson, if you could state your name, address, and you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, it is Tricia Clarkson, 699 Fortai Drive, Peterborough. Um, thanks for allowing me to speak tonight on the proposed 9.59% tax hike. Um, I'm strongly opposed to it um, for the following reasons. 9.59% uh, tax hikes higher than the rate of inflation, which is currently at 3.8% right now. Um, and our municipal taxes should try to match the <clears throat> rate of inflation because residents and homeowners are having a hard time making ends meet as it is. Um, as Peterborough is the number one city in Canada that has the most amount of seniors, most of who are living on small pensions, Council should consider raising taxes no more than 3.8%, same rate as inflation. A 9.59% tax hike is much higher than the percentage allowed for annual rent control hikes in Ontario by landlords, which is currently 2.5%. The city should try to keep in line with a few percentages of rent hikes. There should be a cap on how much the city is allowed to jump its taxes, just as there's a cap on how much landlords are allowed to increase their rent percentages. <clears throat> Landlords will also be adversely affected by the city's drastic tax increase because they're only allowed to raise rents 2.5%. Well, at the same time, they'll have to pay 9.59% in taxes. Um, the value of our homes are actually going down, not up, so our property taxes should go down as well. City store, store owners, restaurant owners, and businesses will also be adversely affected because fewer people will be able to eat out, go to bars, buy new items, as they'll need to save this money for their taxes, which um, could be store owners could could be as high as a thousand dollars a year. Business owners losing revenue will also be stuck with a 9.59 percent tax increase, so they'll lose money on both ends hopefully, and not go bankrupt. Um, residents are already feeling the pinch from a higher cost of living, higher gas prices, and higher food prices. Just about everything's gone up. Um, so it'll be hard coming up with an extra five or $600 a year for taxes that are spent on hiring 38 new staff members. Um, and I'm wondering if the new staff, 38 new staff positions are absolutely a necessity or an absolute emergency, because that's how we should all be living right now, spending our money on necessities and emergencies. Um, many climate change activists started a climate change emergency fund a few years ago so the city could tax us and all Peterborough residents an extra 0.25% on our taxes each year. That means that on top of the 9.59% proposed tax hike, residents will also have to pay an extra 0.25% for the Climate Emergency Fund. Does that bring the percentage up to 9.84%? <clears throat> if so, this is outrageously high. 
regarding the climate emergency, how has the city spent that 2.5% increase to reduce emissions? Um, the city declared an emerg a climate emergency um, a few years ago, um, but isn't spending it on reducing emissions. I see it increasing emissions with five high carbon footprint city projects that are now over budget. <clears throat> not how I want my taxpayer dollars spent, <clears throat> and then to charge residents 9.59% for the city's big money projects is just adding insult to injury. Trisha, one more minute, please. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> During a climate emergency, we all need to stop spending money as if we can get it from taxpayers. $79.2 million is an extravagant amount for salaries when you consider that many people are working or have worked for nonprofit organizations for much less, usually around an average of $20 an hour. Um, during a climate emergency, city salaries should be in line with nonprofit organization salaries, many, many whom are providing a much more <clears throat> needed service to city residents. And last year, the city, city of Toronto raised its taxes 5.5%, biggest tax hike since amalgamation, and there was a huge outcry from Toronto residents. Imagine what a 9.59% increase will do to Peterborough residents. Um, it should, the city should get the money from PDI funds um, if it hasn't got enough. And the last paragraph is just that um, I suggest that the city um, cut this task this tax hike in half so that we only get uh, an increase of 4.5% instead of 9.959%. And that's about it. Thank you very much, uh, Tricia. Any questions from council? Count Councillor Baldwin. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm just wondering, uh, Tricia, which, uh, which services do you want cut to get us down to 4.5%? which is still over inflation. I think you said 3.8%. Can you give us a list of the things you want us to cut to get us down to 4%? Well, I don't know. Like all of this, those the staffing positions that were listed in the examiner, um, like how, how many of, of those could you, could you consider reducing or maybe having uh, one staff staffing position do the uh, have more responsibilities so that you don't have to hire two people you can just hire w one person you know maybe with a different uh, um, adding more responsibilities to that one position I, I mean there's there's ways that we all have to figure how to you know reduce our expenditures and the way we do our you know in our households and maybe get do you, does the city get the, the absolute lowest estimates for each one of its projects and then take that estimate because that's how i run my household i mean that's how we sort of have to as taxpayers uh, just to get by so i don't know but that's those are just questions i guess i have uh, left to ask um but i i just i've just never seen such a such a large hike, um, uh, you know, since I've been here 25 years paying taxes. So um, it's it's really quite shocking. Councillor Baldwin? Anything further? Mr. Chair, I think that's my only question this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much, Tricia. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. Yeah. Uh, Patricia Wilson, Community Race Relations Committee of Peterborough, please. Hello. Hello. Name. Patricia Wilson. Address. 335 King Street. And you have five minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Community Race Relations Committee of Peterborough to speak about the City Service Grant Program. For those of you who don't know us, we are a nonprofit, community-based nonprofit that is dedicated to promoting positive race relations within our community. CRC has been around for over 40 years and was formed originally in response to racist attacks on international students at Trent and Fleming College with the objective of raising awareness, educating, and documenting issues of racism within Nagoji and Peterborough. For over 40 years, we have been committed to encouraging and promoting equitable race relations in Peterborough through providing advocacy supports, consultation services, and public education initiatives for the purpose of promoting a greater understanding of race-related issues. We have been very fortunate to be recipients of the Community Service Grant over the years and are thankful for this continued support from the city, especially over the past couple of years um, as we have worked to bounce back from the impacts of COVID-19. 
The community service grant has directly contributed to our organization's growth, stability, and transition into an equitable post-COVID-19 recovery for our community. This funding has helped support the coordinator's position and has helped CRC with the capacity to lead community events that center important racial and cultural e um, equity, to develop new anti-racism training modules for community education, and to incre increase organization's capacity to provide much needed advocacy services here in Peterborough. Like other organizations, we were really greatly impacted by the pandemic. Racialized community members in general have reported experiencing long-term disconnection, heightened sensitivity to ongoing microaggressions and racial discrimination in our community. It was reported in 2021 that Peterborough has the second highest rate of hate crimes and race-based incidents in Canada, according to census data, and I've recently heard that number has more than doubled in 2023. Now more than ever, our services and supports um, that we provide are desperately needed. Over the past year, we have focused on research and programming with the intent to address racism in our in our community through the lens of collective healing and recovery. As a result, our programming were heavily focused on healing opportunities that centered advoca on advocacy and support for BIPOC mental health and wellness. This included healing circles and the formation and launch of the BIPOC peer support group, which created needed special space for racialized individuals. While focusing on recovery and resilience, we also acknowledged that representation in spaces in leadership and learning would be critical to collective healing and decolonization. Therefore, many of our events became platforms for advocacy, which amplified Black and Indigenous local change makers art activists through cultural learning experiences, public speaking engagements, and collaborative events. In the past year and a half, we have had three advocacy cases, 18 BIPOC mental health advocacy sessions that serve over 183 people. We've had 16 workshops and trainings that, uh, that supported over 618 people uh, with various ranges of folks attending. I actually led some today with my staff um, for the social services um, staffing through the city. Um, we've had 24 collective partnerships and events serving over 553 people in our in our community. We've had six online events that reached over uh, 1,500 people as well. In addition to the CRSC sits on multiple steering committees, participates in panel discussions and focus groups. The work that we do is integral to our community. We are one of 22 organizations in Peterborough that is the recipient of the city service grant and are facing the proposed cuts to funds. I ask that you please consider my request along here with others that have come today um, to not make the proposed cuts to our funding and to reinstate the 1.5% proposed increase to the city service grant funding so that many organizations in our our community uh, can continue doing the amazing work that we do. Thank you so much for your time. Patricia, thank you. Any questions from council? Thank you very much. Um, Colin McAdam, Public Energy Performing Arts, please. If you'd be kind enough to state your name yes. and address. And Good evening. You have five minutes. Um, uh, to all of you, all respected councillors, thanks very much for the work you do and the decisions you make on behalf of all of us. Uh, my name is Colin McAdam. I live at uh, where do I live? 607 Stewart Street uh, and in Town Ward, and I'm chair of Public Energy. Um, last year, we had uh, over 2,700 uh, people uh, attend our 27 uh, events that we uh, sponsored and co-sponsored. We're now in our 30th year. Thank you for this opportunity to address you concerning the budget and in particular, the arts section of the community investment grants. Public Energy Performing Arts is asking you in these difficult times uh, to at least maintain the minimum uh, from uh, 2022, the minimum level of funding in this sector. My wife, Joy Simmons and I are very serious about the arts. She is a cellist with the uh, Peterborough Symphony and vice chair of the Kawartha Youth Orchestra. We met at Trent 25, or 25, 45 years ago. <laughs> How quickly we forget. Um, and we returned to Peterborough 16 years ago because of the art scene here. Uh, I sing with the Peterborough Singers. I was chair of the board there for three years. I've been the chair of public energy for the last seven years. I'm also a modern dancer with uh, old men dancing. Public energy serves the entire uh, Peterborough community with opportunities to create and experience artistic performance. We use city money, especially for outreach and community engagement. These activities are not covered by provincial or federal funders. Things like providing sign language at performances and startup costs for new project development. 
just last year, one of these new works was picked up by a national uh, festival of dance. We're very proud of that. Any reduction in city funding directly impacts our artists and our audience. I want to end with a focus on youth in the arts. It's, in some, it's inspiring for an old guy like me at Public Energy to see so many young people from our diverse local communities turning to the arts to help navigate this difficult world that they have inherited. As creators and as audience, at Public Energy, we promote that engagement. It makes Peterborough a smart and exciting place to live. No amount of funding loss is insignificant in the arts sector. I ask you please, in these difficult times, to at least maintain the funding at the 2022 level for community, uh, for community investment grants in the arts sector. Thanks very much. Thank you. Are there any questions of the presenter? Seeing none, thank you very much, Colin. Sarah Cullingham, Electric City Culture Council, please EC3. Thank you, Sarah, your name, address, and away you go. Thank you. Sarah Cullingham, I live at 546 Waterford Street in Town Ward. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mayor Leo, members of council, I appreciate the opportunity to address you this evening and provide input on the city's 2024 draft budget. I'm here as a representative of the Electric City Culture Council's Board of Directors. I'm also a PhD candidate at Trent University, and I'm an active volunteer with a number of different arts-based and social justice-oriented organizations in the city. I moved to Peterborough in 2013, this year after the city adopted its first municipal cultural plan. It was through this plan that EC3 was established as, and I quote, an arm's length agency responsible for coordinating, communicating, and advocating for Peterborough's arts and culture organizations. I'm here today to help fulfill this mandate and to voice my own support for ongoing municipal investments in the arts and culture sector. As a resident of this city, a place that four generations of my family now call home, I see great value in the municipal investments in the arts. And I wanna start by acknowledging the foundational support that council continues to provide this sector from more longstanding programs like the funding provided to EC3 to deliver Arts Week to more recent additions such as the Poet Laureate Program or the grants to individual artists. These are critical investments in community well-being and vitality. And they directly support the city's vision of building, these are your words, a forward-looking contemporary community thriving in creativity and a modern economy. Funding for arts organizations not only supports the creative heart of our city's economy, it also contributes to community cohesion and the social fabric upon which our city is built. Peterborough is not alone in making these kinds of investments. In fact, the Municipal Benchmarking Network Canada, formerly OMBI, whose benchmarking figures uh, comparing municipal spending are included in the city's cultural plan, devote a whole section of their annual report to cultural services, which they define as the municipal investment in culture, local artists, heritage professionals, as well as arts and heritage organizations. They further acknowledge that the provision of these services um, enriches quality of life, generates considerable benefits, and greatly contributes to a community's ability to build wealth through innovation and creativity. And isn't that what our property taxes should be doing? Building our collective wealth and enriching quality of life? The city's own cultural plan acknowledges that municipal spending on arts and culture can be leveraged by arts organization to generate tens of dollars more for every dollar invested, and that this spending is best understood as an investment rather than a cost. I urge council to keep this understanding in mind throughout this budgeting process. And while I recognize that you face difficult decisions in this year's round of budgeting, it is short-sighted to look to arts funding, which makes up a relatively small proportion of the city's overall budget to find efficiencies. Rather, I would encourage you to see this as the investment it is and find as much available funding as possible to put towards it. 
As our elected officials, we are looking to you to chart a course towards our collective vision of a city thriving in creativity. While it is up to staff to do the work of analyzing options and providing you with the calculations needed to make informed decisions, at the end of the day, it is up to you to ensure we follow through on our collective commitments and make the investments we need to build the kind of community we all want to live in. And for me and many other residents of the city, some of whom you've heard from this evening, that community includes a vibrant arts and culture sector made up of diverse community-based organizations. Your support and our ongoing municipal investments is critical in this pursuit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Any questions of the presenter? Seeing none, thank you very much. That, um, that ends the public delegations tonight. I would like to say on behalf of council, thank you for everybody that comes out tonight. Um, it takes a great deal to come forward and ask for money. And uh, we don't, we experience the same things all the time, but we do listen, we do hear. Uh, the result may not be what everybody wants, but it's nonetheless well thought out. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, the next meeting will be tomorrow evening at uh, six o'clock. And I'd ask for a mover for adjournment. Councillor Crowley, your worship, all in favor. Thank you. What's this? Oh, they're doing it through eScribe. I don't have eScribe, so I'm voting yes. <laughs> Councillor Beamers is not set up either, but. Actually, Andrew, you could use mine. That's it, we're adjourned. <laughs>